All right, everyone, as uh, more and more people join us, I want to thank everyone uh, for being here with us uh, on this very, very difficult Monday morning. This is not a discussion uh, that we ever thought we would need to have, uh, nor are we uh, barely three days into this war in any position uh, to answer many of the questions that I assume uh, are on top of everyone's minds. Uh, we have the distinct pleasure of having uh, some uh, some incredibly uh, well-informed, uh, thoughtful people here. Uh, I will very briefly introduce them as I ask them questions. Uh, and I know that this is people's lunch hour, and I know that many of us uh, have spent hours and days uh, immersed uh, in this absolute terror. So I want to keep this conversation uh, short, uh, decisive, and informative. Uh, I want to go straight to you, Gadi Taub, uh, one of Israel's premier journalists and analysts, uh, historians, uh, to ask you the most unfair of questions. Gadi, what the hell is going on? We still don't know. Um, confusion is rife here, um, and 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 the picture is uh, keeps updating. But uh, but what we do know is that this they this was an extremely sophisticated and well coordinated attack. We know the tactics come from Hezbollah. We see Iran's fingerprints all over this. And everyone's guess is that the timing is not an accident. The timing is we, we were moving forward to peace with Saudi Arabia. And this is the Iranian way to try and use its, its proxies in order to drive a Palestinian wedge between uh, the Gulf states, the Sunni states, uh, and Israel in order to break the circle that Iran sees as, as uh, forming uh, around it, the way the way this was uh, the way this was done shocked Israelis to the core. I don't know if you know, but there's a Holocaust survivor, 85 year old woman, among the hostages, and one. It, it's unfathomable what 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 she's been through. You know, escaping the Nazis as a teenager and probably dreaming about that for the rest of her life in post trauma, and now there she is again in their hands. And and for the first time since the Holocaust, we see this kind of mass slaughter. And the pictures you've seen, I don't know how, how some of them are, can be shown on, on social media or any, anywhere else, but people are deeply shaken because, you know, if after the Holocaust, we said never again, this touched the exact same nerve and people were feeling completely hopeless as as these animals, these barbarians have been slaughtering babies, children, the elderly indiscriminately. Um, and and so uh, our sense of security, which has which has been one of the, I guess pillars of the Israeli psyche, that unlike the diaspora that we will we will not suffer pogroms here, has been has been deeply shaken. Uh, Michael Duran, uh, former Defar Department of Defense uh, <clears throat> official, Hudson Institute. I want to ask you a similarly unfair question, uh, and you will answer it because you're, you're wearing a tie, uh, and therefore I know that you you know things. Um, how could anywhere between numbers I'm seeing anywhere between 600 and 1,000 uh, Hamas terrorists, some of them as young as 16 or 17, on pickup trucks overwhelm the billion dollar fence uh, erected by, uh, what is it, the fifth mightiest army in the world? Uh, th that's an amazing story. It really is reminiscent of, uh, of <clears throat> Yom Kippur, 1973. Uh, the, I think there are several elements to it. One is deception. Uh, Hamas uh, managed to convince uh, the Israelis that it was uh, it had been defeated basically, and had become a manager of Gaza and was interested in getting rich uh, and wanted to promote uh, uh, promote uh, workers being allowed to work in uh, in Israel. And the Israelis bought it. I mean, they, they, that Hamas was interested in butter, not guns. Uh, this is a this is a play that the West keeps buying with China, with Iran, uh, uh, with Russia. 
uh, as well. It doesn't uh, recognize that these um, that these states are out to undermine the international order. In the case of Hamas, destroy Israel. They don't want to just integrate into the existing uh, existing order. Uh, secondly, um, Israel's over reliant on the Shmoni Matayim, uh, you know, startup nation military uh, that can do everything electronically. Uh, and the uh, and Hamas uh, uh, undoubtedly uh, we don't have direct evidence of this, but one assumes with the help of the Iranians uh, mapped out the electronic sensors of the the system based on towers, and it took out the towers with the um, with the uh, with drones, and so it blinded the first the first line of defense is the is the are the electronic sensors, and it took those out thereby blinding the, um, the, the, the Israelis. And then it did something very clever. They, uh, they, they breached the fence in some 20 different places and they went across with, um, with paragliders. They did a massive rocket attack. They also sent people in Jeeps and they sent people in motorcycles. And they also just sent, they opened up the, the they breached the fence and they just let, uh, and they just let normal uh, you know, young men, civilians who are not necessarily Hamas operatives to go through. So um, the the point of this, all of these different breaches at the same time, and then different kinds of attacks, paragliders, drones, uh, motorcycles, uh, and so on, is that confused the, the, the second line of sensors, the human sensors who are trying to look at what happens, uh, at, at what's going on, and trying to categorize the nature of the attack that's uh, that's going on and prioritize the the response. Um, they also took over apparently the division headquarters uh, uh, in the south, and then uh, and then so paralyzed the the paralyzed the 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 brain at the uh, in the south that needs to actually come to a conclusion about what's happening and tell the rest of the system uh, uh, what to uh, what what to do. This matters because you have in the, in the military. The different kinds of breaches require different responses. You know, if it's if it's drones and rockets, then it's Iron Dome. If it's um, uh, if it's a terrorist attack, then it's special forces uh, and uh, uh, and so on. So you have to activate that part of your military that's going to take care of the right uh, of the um, uh, that's going to take care of the of the particular challenge. They overwhelm that part of the system, and you can only do that. This is what makes it so sophisticated. Is that the 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 tech the technology that they used to do this was really re relatively primitive in military terms, but the understanding of the Israeli systems and how to override them and confuse them was highly sophisticated, and that's why we think that you know that 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 Iran is involved. In addition to the fact that the weapons they're using are are uh, Iranian weapons and everything else, uh, including the fact that. Palestinian Islamic Jihad is an organic uh, extension of um, uh, uh, of uh, of Iran. Uh, finally, there was the fact that Israel was just unready. Uh, the the most of its forces were in the West Bank. Uh, it was a high holiday, just like Yom Kippur, 1973, uh, and people uh, people believed that they were uh, in, that they were that they were safe. That the chance of uh, the, the chance of a, um, a, a war was uh, was very small, and so there was total unpreparedness about what to do um, uh, in 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 response. I'm sure that we're going to be studying this for the next 20, 30, 40 years, just like the, the Yom Kippur War. The deaths on one day are greater than the, any of the uh, any day in the Yom Kippur uh, uh, Yom Kippur War. And as Gandhi said, this you know the nature of these deaths. And the kidnappings um, and and just uh, the general terror it is reminiscent of uh, reminiscent of uh, Kishniev or the Holocaust. Uh, so this is going to this is going to sear the Israeli psyche, and we're going to be debating uh, the fault, and we're going to learn things as time goes on. The, the 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 deception operation in particular, I'm 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 particularly interested in learning more about that because I suspect that international uh, uh, I don't have any evidence of this. My gut just tells me international actors like the United States and others, Europeans, Russians, perhaps Egyptians, uh, were similarly deceived or played a role in this somehow. We'll have to yet uh, find out what that will be. Thank you. Uh...
Michael, this is a, a good opportunity to remind uh, everyone listening to us right now, even though we're all Zoom veterans, uh, that if you have any questions, uh, kindly post them in the Q&A. Uh, as I said, we want to keep this discussion to around 40 minutes, but we will definitely take some time to answer your questions. But um, Tony Badran, uh, Foundation for Defense of Democracies, Tablet Magazine contributor, and uh, I'm going to go out and say it on behalf of, of everyone in the world, uh, our, our finest uh, Middle East analyst. Um, Michael said repeatedly, you know, there are there are fingerprints, uh, Iranian fingerprints on this operation. And yet, uh, just the other day, uh, Secretary of State Blinken uh, said that there is no evidence, this is a talking point that has since been repeated by several people within the administration, no evidence that Iran is involved. Uh, why are we hearing uh, these statements and how do you understand them? So why we're hearing the statements, one can speculate uh, with the easy uh, uh, answer. The first easy answer is that, uh, uh, you know, these guys have, uh, as one uh, official, probably Brett McGurk uh, put it, um, that they've communicated with the Iranians that, you know, their involvement could threaten future initiatives with the U.S. So uh, this crew is planning future initiatives with uh, uh, a country that they consider to be a partner or at least a potential partner, uh, not as an enemy. And so it is very much in their interest to make sure that the Iranians are not, uh, there's no re direct responsibility attributed to them in this particular attack because of all of the images that we're seeing uh, in order to safeguard their policy, which um, Mike and I wrote in tablet is, uh, is a realignment of U.S. interests with Iran. That is the Obama-Biden policy. That's what these guys are implementing. So that's that's the easy uh, uh, answer. The second one in support of this, uh, which is more spin that they're going to use, and I already see it with their echo chamber in, in the media, is that if we were to actually point the finger at a direct Iranian uh, role, then we would be opening the door to a broader regional conflagration, which in turn could um, encompass uh, U.S. forces and endanger U.S. forces in the region. So it is the better part of prudence to, uh, while, to you know, while we admit uh, that uh, Hamas and Hezbollah and all these players get support from Iran, it would be not prudent to go to this doctrine which we saw during the Trump years, which led to the uh, elimination of terror mastermind Qasem Soleimani, uh, that any attack, even if it were uh, executed by Iranian proxies, Iran itself would be held responsible for it. So this is something, you know, from a crew that actually mourned the death of Qasem Soleimani, this is something that they do not want to see for sure. But there is possibly a third and I would say arguably even more disturbing possibility. Uh, you saw there was a piece in the Wall Street Journal uh, just yesterday about uh, you know, the uh, Iranian-led um, joint control operations room in, in, in uh, command, sorry, uh, uh, headquarters in Lebanon that uh, may have actually put this whole thing together with Hamas and Hezbollah and other Palestinian uh, organizations. Now, the story about this command center is not new. This came out from the Iranians and Hezbollah themselves in 2021 uh, after the Gaza war of that, of that year. And uh, the signaling from Israel in particular about joint uh, Hezbollah, uh, PIJ, and uh, Hamas um, uh, co collaboration in Lebanon with the Iranians, uh, with the IRGC present, has been ongoing for two years. So that part isn't necessarily news. What's interesting is actually the timeline that they mention, uh, which is which is interesting also in light of the these very stern denials and very specific denials by the administration that the Iranians had nothing to do with, and we have absolutely no information that could possibly point to that, to that thing, uh, to that possibility. Uh, so. The timeline that the Wall Street Journal gives is that they started this sometime in the summer, close to August, probably a little bit before. What was happening in the summer? Uh, it's important for, on two sides, on the Hezbollah side and on the US side. On the Hezbollah side, 
uh, both Gadi and Mike mentioned the tactics uh, that Hamas used in this. In fact, you can actually see a, an exact preview of those tactics in a Hezbollah-produced video that was released in July, including the drone dropping a bomb uh, on the Merkava tank, including the breaching of the fence, the ATVs, the motorcycles, all of it. This was Hezbollah tactics. This was IRGC tactics that were taught to Hamas. Where interesting where, where that happened. But uh, uh, so the fingerprints tactically are there. And it was at a time when Hezbollah was uh, upping the ante on the border with Lebanon, uh, with, uh, in Lebanon with, with Israel. Uh, they established this uh, outpost in the Hardov region. And they started doing a lot of provocation on the border fence. What did the administration do? The administration encouraged the Israelis, lulled them, do not escalate, do not take action. Instead, here's what you're going to do. You're going to sit in a process with Hezbollah and you're gonna discuss border demarcation. You're not gonna retaliate. We're gonna do with you what we did with the client government of Yair Lapid. You're gonna sit down and enter into a process with Hezbollah. We're going to depressurize, to de-escalate. We're gonna integrate you with Hezbollah. That's what was happening. The question, of course, that is yet to be answered is just as there was intelligence deception from Gaza that Michael uh, mentioned, whether uh, US signals intelligence, which is very active in, in a place like Lebanon, had also picked up something uh, in Lebanon, and whether that is uh, also a source of potential embarrassment uh, that that information did not make it to the Israelis. Um, uh, especially when there were these other political and diplomatic initiatives based on this regional integration, pro-Iran realignment policy that this administration is pushing and shoving down Israel's throat. So that, I think we will have to wait and see how that story develops. I want, thank you, Tony. I, I, I want to uh, ask a few more questions about Iran and the Iran policy in a little bit. But first, uh, I want to say hi to, to my dear friend and colleague, uh, Tablets News Editor, Jake Siegel, uh, straight out of Madin. Um, Jake, I think one thing that bothers a lot of people here uh, and really truly boggles the mind is in addition to all these uh, intelligence uh, failures that, that Mike spoke of a minute ago, uh, it seems to have taken the IDF a very long time uh, to deploy uh, in, in the South, uh, to regain control of the South. In fact, there are still some communities, according to my understanding, at least as uh, late as a few hours ago, uh, where in, in Otef Aza, in the sort of community, uh, communities enveloping the border with Gaza, that uh, are still active uh, scenes of, of war. Uh, what's, what's going on, according to your understanding, uh, with the IDF right now? Let me take the, the second narrower point first. Um, technically, there is still there are still clearing operations going on in the south. I'm not sure that that means that there's active fighting still going on in the south. And I'm not saying there's not active fighting, but that's a distinction. So when you have uh, enemy infiltrated into your area of operations, into your country, uh, as it were, and you are you're needing to then clear them out. That is a painstaking, dangerous uh, process because you cannot declare an area has been fully cleared until you have either destroyed it utterly or physically examined every inch of it. This is why um, you know urban warfare is so treacherous because room to room and building to building clearing is both highly uh, uh, difficult in terms of how many steps it involves, highly exposed. So um, there are certainly still operations ongoing in the South. I'm not certain that there is active fighting still. The larger point, that seems to me that that will be the bigger legacy of, um, of, of the massacre that took place. An intelligence failure in some ways is easier to explain away than an operational failure. Uh, an intelligence failure is something that uh, can always be uh, attributed to sort of multivariate causes. But what we had here in cases where 
and there are reports of um, areas in the south, uh, people in kibbutzes in the south, where they didn't get any military or, or police presence for eight hours yesterday. And to go eight hours um, in a not only in a, in a, a country with as advanced uh, military as Israel, but in a country where the whatever you could say about the problems of the government, whatever you could say about the enemies um, of the state, it, it was a comfort to people. It was a, a certainty almost that the the military at least could perform, and there have been. A handful of people over the years, uh, retired former IDF officials who have uh, issued some warnings, uh, Yitzhak Parikh, um, Gershon uh, you know, a, a few isolated individuals who have issued some warnings about a, a kind of hollowing out of the IDF. Um, and I don't know. Uh, that that's what caused this, uh, uh, but certainly the level of operational failure uh, is enormous, and I think in some ways will be in terms of the the sort of um, the, the searching for uh, the inward searching for failures here, and, and what didn't happen that needed to happen. I think that that will be a lasting legacy and and one other point with that is um you know there are there's already a sort of uh political debate inside israel about whether you know there were units shifted from the south um to to stop you know there's a sort of the uh, people who who are uh, part of the protest movement saying that the units were shifted to deal with settler violence uh, uh, there, obviously, there was also a, a spate of terror attacks uh, in the West Bank, so it would have made sense to shift units because of that. But the those that debate, while not illegitimate, um, cannot cover for the larger operational failure. Even if units had been shifted, as they clearly were, that still would not account for an eight-hour delay in securing. Uh, you know, securing the South, it still would not account for how long it took to effectively uh, marshal combat power in the South. So the causes of that, the reasons for that are, you know, I, I certainly don't know now. I don't think uh, we'll know all of the answers for some time. That is that is the essential question. Thank you, Jake. I, I, I want to return uh, in a moment to, to Israel's internal political situation. But first of all, uh, I want to clear one more point. And for this, I turn to Talbot's own uh, Lee Smith, best-selling author um, and, and a person you know who's been writing about uh, the, the Iran deal from, from the very beginning. So um, another talking point from the administration we've been hearing a lot these last few days is that the billions and billions of dollars that uh, were handed over to Iran uh, are in no way, shape, or form uh, used to finance any uh, terrorist operations, et cetera. Can you, can you explain uh, this argument? Well, um, um, hi, everybody. Um, thanks, Leo. Um, uh, I mean, besides the obvious point, we don't need advanced degrees in a counting to recognize that money can be moved around and whoever's keeping the books in the Islamic Republic of Iran they're 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 not answering to uh they're not answering to uh, accountants the the more important thing is and it, it's this is a this is a fact that a lot of people uh, have missed it's not the six, just the 6 billion dollars that's been freed up uh in South Korea there's another 10 billion dollars right from, coming from Iraq there was a waiver so it's actually 16 billion dollars the important thing about this it's not just the money it's what the money signals the same with the iran deal and the sanctions that were relieved the amount of money that came in when you give someone access to 16 billion dollars regardless of what it's for right it, it, it might be a clothing budget but if you give someone 16 billion dollars you're signaling friendship and comity 
right? You're not signaling that you perceive this actor to be a problem. And in lots of ways, I don't think that it's just this. Um, I think there were many other ways that the Biden administration effectively greenlighted Iranian operations, not just here, but Iranian operations in the world. And I think the $16 billion is a very big part of that. Um, thank you, Lee. I Before we take uh, a few questions, and there are uh, many, many of them, and they're excellent. Gadi, I want to return to you uh, for a moment and ask you um, to talk a little bit about the feeling in Israel right now. This, this war came uh, after months and months and months of sort of unprecedented uh, political uh, unrest with massive protests against the government with a feeling that many of us had uh, that things are kind of teetering in the brink of, of an unprecedented divide in Israeli society. Uh, is this war bringing people together or are you seeing the same fissures uh, that you saw these last couple of months getting uh, deeper and more violent uh, now that the country is under attack? The second option. Um, it, it, for now, it's it, at least... I don't think the press has ever attacked the government so viciously in the midst of so severe a crisis. We don't have many comparisons, but we we can we can look beyond Israel. We can look at Pearl Harbor. We can look at 9/11. We could look at the Yom Kippur War here, and the 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 press is it, it still seems like the 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 top priority is anti Bibi. So now they're calling for the prime minister to resign. I remind you that Chamberlain. Uh, it took it took a long time until Chamberlain uh, resigned in the summer of 1940. The war was declared in September of 39. So even if these, and I'm not saying and not hinting that Netanyahu is Chamberlain here, but even if the the, the prime minister and and he of course should be held accountable. Obviously, this is not the right moment to do any such things. So uh, so the protest movement, I think. They they can't stop themselves, and in a way, things became a little more violent, at least for the initial phase. I can tell you that no one ever shouted at me in the streets, about, although you know I, I'm I'm they identify me with the, the government, the reform and supporting uh, Likud and all that. But now, in these last two days, twice people have shouted at me from across the street. That are you happy now? as if you know we are now responsible for this and this is a very strange thing in israel we, we haven't seen such a thing in israel has not been so divided yet and I, and i must say Leo, i i fear that this is only the initial state of a, a, a stage of a much larger surprise so we have to be ready imagine that this is just a the the preliminary act and after uh, Israelis call for the, I don't know, for the subduing Gaza, we will get all our forces into this swamp in, in Gaza. And then a Hezbollah um, uh, attack will begin. And then we will open a new front in Judea and Samaria. And then maybe there are radical cells among uh, Israel's Arabs, which we have seen in uh, Shomer Chomot uh, in May uh, 21 uh, and uh, so 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 it, it is an extremely tense situation to be in while there it, the, the sense of solidarity is not there now the, the good news is I think that the, these clashes are among elites and among journalists and among spin doctors who are still trying to use this occasion for their old political wars but this this shock is tectonic israel has changed it will not go back to what it is old politics are irrelevant now old ideologies are completely defunct so we don't know how things will excuse me mike and tony for borrowing the term realignment we don't know how politics here would realign after after this great shock but but we are sure that we are entering it with insufficient solidarity and insufficient preparedness and and the situation uh, seems to many uh, critical and i can't say that i have any consoling words for them 
So uh, thank you, Gadi, for this sobering uh, assessment. I um, am looking at uh, both the clock and also a very long list of questions. Uh, I'm going to try my best to consolidate a bunch of these questions to sort of thematic blocks. I'm going to present it uh, to the group at large and, and anyone who wishes to take it could. Uh, so the first question is, you know, uh, reminiscent of something you just said, Gadi. Uh, a bunch of, of people are asking, well, uh, we have a really strong sense that this is just a prelude for things to come, that Hezbollah is waiting its moment, uh, that we're going to see something uh, bigger coming. Uh, is there any kind of indication? How should we think about that possibility? Uh, is that for me? I'm sorry. Uh, it's for anyone, but you know what? You you volunteered, so go ahead, Tony. Yeah, <laughs> might as well. Um, so actually, we're witnessing now, uh, some, today, some uh, additional skirmishes uh, on the Lebanese border. Um, there was an infiltration attempt, which is being claimed by the uh, uh, Al-Aqsa brigades. Um, there was retaliation by Israel. Israel blew a, one of those uh, observation uh, towers on the border. Um, there was an exchange of fire, and now there are still unconfirmed claims that uh, one Hezbollah fighter was killed in, in the bombings. Now, it, it's interesting, it's not yet on all of the Hezbollah channels, but it's an interesting development, if true, because that, that would mean that Hezbollah is likely to stage some form of retaliation. Uh, and Hezbollah it, it has a lot of interests here, uh, which you won't be surprised if I say that they are totally in alignment with the US position, which is that they want to make sure that uh, they keep the specter of a second front uh, hanging over Israel as it enters into Gaza uh, in a major ground operation. Now, with uh, of course, the United States considers Lebanon, i.e. Hezbollah land, as a U.S. protectorate. It is going to try to deter Israel from taking action there. Israel, it would seem, is not particularly interested at this uh, moment to have another um, uh, uh, front open as it tries to get its act together in the South. But that is probably as it regains its balance, that will change and it has been preparing for mul multiple fronts, uh, a war on multiple fronts. So uh, I suspect that the, the readiness is going to shift uh, quickly. But uh, again, the, the, the wild card in all of this, both in, in, with, uh, with the Palestinians and especially with Lebanon, and with Iran more generally, is the position of the United States. The United States is signaling that it wants a ceasefire to try to negotiate a hostage release. We don't really want to see a big uh, thank war you. in Gaza. Yeah, thank you for, for bringing this up. And, and, and Mike, I want to go to you because a lot of the questions we're getting uh, are about uh, the hostages, according to most numbers we have right now, anywhere between 100 and, and 200, uh, possibly more than that including as State Department has confirmed uh, several American citizens. Uh, how do, uh, and this is kind of, you know, kind of taking all these questions together, how uh, does the hostage situation complicate and inform uh, the, the next stage of this war? And what, if anything, should Israel do now? Thanks. Let, let me uh, tee off of what Tony just said and, and put it in the context of, um, let, let's imagine this conflict as part of a dialogue between Tehran and the United States, because I, I think that's where we need to, 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 to start with it. Um, the, uh, the Israelis, the, the prime minister has given the Israeli military the job of destroying the military capabilities of Hamas. Um, that almost certainly means there's gonna have to be a serious ground incursion. I don't think you can do this from the air. Now, it, there, there's a little bit of ambiguity there because it allows the IDF to say they destroyed the military. They're the ones who define when the military capability is destroyed. Uh, but but they, we really, they want to end, is, the Israelis want, the Israeli public wants Hamas as a threat to be ended. That is very important from an Israeli point of view, just in terms of the threat coming from Gaza. But it's very important from an American point of view, uh, because if Israel can show 
all of its enemies, including Hezbollah in Lebanon, including the Iranians with their nuclear weapon, that it will not be restrained, and that if somebody crosses its uh, fundamental red lines, it's going to be it's going to take action and it's going to obliterate them. That's a real loss for the Iranians. So, so the Iranians the Iranians want to prevent that. They have the United States on their side to a certain extent. Not 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 uh, not that the Americans are conceiving of it this way, but American policy works to the advantage of the Iranians, as Tony was saying, and we already see it. What was Tony Blinken's immediate response? His immediate response was one to say that uh, uh, to say that uh, that there's no evidence that Iran had a hand in this. Uh, and number two, to call for a ceasefire. He called up Hakan Fidan, the foreign minister of Turkey, and said and talked to him about a ceasefire. Why is it when this is a 9-11 moment for the Israelis, they're going to war to destroy the military capabilities of Hamas. And the United States is already talking with, with regional neighbors about, um, about ceasefire and injecting, and this is to your point, uh, injecting into that discussion with Hakan Fidan the issue of the kidnapped hostages. So the, they're going to make, the United States is going to make the issue of the welfare of the American hostages part of its discussion with the Israelis right now. What that means is the Israelis have a very small window to take action in Gaza before the international pressure starts to come, <clears throat> even from the United States, from its own parochial point of view about the, uh, the hostages, let alone all the demonstrations we're going to see in Europe and elsewhere about um, uh, about uh, uh, about uh, killing of civilians and humanitarian concerns um, uh, and so forth. The uh, Hezbollah, Hezbollah, Hamas is going to use the hostages as human shields. It's going to distribute them. I think the numbers are probably, I don't have any evidence of this, except I see how many people have still not been accounted for. I think we're going to get many more than the 140 or 160, whatever number is being put out. I think we're going to get in the several hundreds uh, before it's all over. But even if it's a lower number, 140. This is unprecedented. They're going to use them as human shields, and then they're going to use them as bargaining chits in the negotiation to get a good deal on the ceasefire, to get a release of prisoners, to put pressure on the Americans. And at stake in this, one last point here, at stake in this, if we look at this as Tehran versus uh, um, the United States or in negotiation, Somebody said at the beginning that the, the goal of this operation from an Iranian point of view was to scuttle the Saudi-Israeli normalization. I think that's absolutely true, but there are many more, uh, there, there are many other goals that the Iranians have. One of them is to preserve their nuclear program uh, and, to, uh, and to, to put on, to force the international agenda of the Middle East, uh, in, the, in the Middle East to conform to their strategic priorities. So this is to distract the Israelis and the world from what they're doing with their nuclear program, uh, and at the same time to deter the Israelis from doing anything about, uh, 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 about the nuclear program. And deterrence, part of their deterrence is exactly as Tony said, keeping alive keeping alive that uh, second front option of a, an attack from Hezbollah that actually deters the Israelis militarily, but it also strikes fear in the hearts of the Americans who are going to come in there by, by, by nature, the Biden administration wants to come in and integrate, de-escalate, whatever the phrase they use to appease Iran. Thank you. Lee Smith, I think this one's for you. There, there are four or five people asking uh, if we have any evidence of any involvement or benefit, direct or otherwise, of either the Russians or the Chinese? Um, well, when people were speculating uh, before, I think it was Mike probably talking about the intelligence, um, the intelligence failure, which Jake mentioned too, and they were talking about, like, well, did the Iranians, uh, did the Iranians <laughs> help crash certain? Uh, certain electronic systems. I, 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 whenever I hear the Iranians, uh, the, the the Iranians in crashing uh, communication system, I always think that that what people are really talking about are the Chinese. You'll remember a few years ago there was a story about a number of U.S. agents, um, a number of U.S. agents in Iran and China who were, you know, uh, CIA assets who were. That were leaked was that it was the Iranians who discovered it, and as the reporting became thicker and thicker, it became more obvious what had really happened—that it was the Chinese who had who had rolled up this program. So, 
I imagine that's one of the things we're going to see here. And one of the things we'll, we'll, we'll almost certainly see Russian involvement too. I think it's important to keep in mind that the uh, Russians and Iranians are not only partnered <laughs> in, in an abstract sense, but the Russians and Iranians were part are, are still partnered in Syria. So yeah, Lee, I, I, Lee, Lee also yeah. Qatar, which you which you write about so often. Yeah. Qatari money is involved in this. You you investigated this more well, than anyone I, else. Well, Qatar. I mean, Qatar also is you know isn't uh, Haniya there or so you know so so Qatar. Uh, you know, Qatar is is certainly um, Qatar certainly pl pl play, plays a role in this. You know, I mean, Qatar plays a very negative play, plays a very negative role regionally, and this is part of it. But I think, yeah, when people are talking about the rising uh, anti-American bloc, what we're talking about is China, Russia, and Iran. And um, you know, again, if we see this in a geo, uh, a larger context around the world, and when people say, "Oh my goodness, we have to support the Ukrainians because if we don't, what's going to happen? What's put? Uh, what are the Chinese going to think about Taiwan?" Well, let's keep in mind some of the other things that are going on here. Is the United States, first of all, capable of defending itself? against the Chinese, against the Iranians, and what's going to happen here? Will the Biden administration see this in the same way? Uh, we have to look, and 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 by the way, I, I think a lot of the talk coming out of the Biden administration about the coming war with China stuff is nonsense, right? I mean, I mean you know, most of you guys know my thesis that the Americans are 100% behind the rise of chi China, and a lot of the coming war with China stuff is an information operation. It's nonsense. But if if there are people in Washington who take it seriously, they're going to have to look to this as well, right? Because this is the anti the rising anti U.S. block. And if you let Iran, uh, if, if Iran has a big win here, then that's a major problem globally for U.S. interests. Thank you, Lee. Uh, we're we're coming really really close uh, on on our uh, designated end time. So so I have one quick question, uh, and and then a very even quicker question for all of you. My quick question, uh, which again we're receiving from uh, from a host of listeners, uh, is this is not just you know this current administration. Uh, the Iran deal has been the cornerstone of uh, you know Obama's presidency throughout eight years uh, of of him being in office. And by now seems a kind of you know major uh, tenet of belief of the Democratic Party. We're now uh, in an election year. Uh, should the the Democrat Party uh, reconsider uh, its its main uh, foreign policy, and should voters uh, reconsider political allegiances based on what they're seeing on the ground in the last three days? To no one in particular. To anyone brave enough to step into that one. Yes, I, I mean, well, I'll just say very quickly, I mean, of course they should have, but since 2010, but nonetheless, what we see here is what we saw over the weekend is what happens when you unleash the Iranians, right? When you realign, as Tony and Mike have written, when you realign American interests with those of the Islamic Republic of Iran, what we're seeing, this is the direct result. This is what happened. Was this precisely the intention? I, 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 we will leave that for history to decide, but should the Democrats reconsider their view? I mean, we should ask, we should note, part of the big picture here is the US alignment with Iran is, there is an Iranian agent at the Pentagon, right? Chief of staff to the deputy secretary of defense for special operations. So when people are talking about, did the Americans know that Iran was involved? Were the Americans listening to what was going on? Were they listening uh, to the Iranians speaking to Hamas? Remember, the big picture is this. The Americans are comfortable with an Iranian agent at the DOD. The Biden administration's Iran envoy, like the administration's Iran envoy, Rob Malley, funded and supported them through an NGO cutout, the International Crisis Group, funded and supported an Iranian spy ring. That's the big picture. So should Democrats revise their ideas about the Iran deal? Absolutely. Will it happen? No. The United States is split decisively over this. Can I can I say the same thing in a less partisan fashion? <laughs> I, you could try. I, I I think the I think that the the pro Israel community needs to rethink what it means to be pro Israeli, and we won't necessarily not to put it in in in, in Republican or Democratic terms, but historically, if you stand up and you say I I love Israel in my kishkas. And you say, I want to give more aid to Israel. 
and I stand with Israel, and Israel has a right to defend itself, and so on, you are pro-Israel. And that re leads to what I call the Robert Menendez uh, syndrome, where you're, uh, Menendez is anti-Iran nukes, and so Men Men Menendez is, 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 is pro-Israel. Is pro -Israel. Meanwhile, Menendez is supporting Armenia, which is an ally of Iran, right? It means you can you you can be uh, you can be Barack Obama and you can go to the uh, uh, Addis Israel here in the, in the, in DC and put on a kippah and tell Jeffrey Goldberg that you feel Israel in your kishkes and everyone says wonderful. Meanwhile, you've turned Syria into a smoldering pile of rubble next to Israel, and you've allowed it to become a, a, an arena for Iranian and Russian uh, uh, domination. That's not pro-Israel. And so the, you, you have to have a sense of the pattern of power in the region and of the pattern of power in Washington and ask whether the, the sum of these policies is, is, building a, um, is, is building an international system that works to the advantage of Israel. And th that's a hard thing to do because it's easier to have an, a kind of bilateral litmus test. Aid, Kishkis, oh, I got it. He's one of us. Mike, you want hard things to do. I'm going to give you an even harder thing to, to do, and I'm giving this to every single person on the panel in one or two sentences uh, on this very dark Monday. I want you to, to take us home with one thing, uh, if you could think of it, that gives you some glimmer, however faded, of hope, if not right now, then maybe possibly in the, in the moderate or long-term future. And Mike, you're in the hot seat, so I'm starting with you. No, the one the one thing that gives you a glimmer of hope are the stories that are uh, that are are not made up of uh, of heroism by everyday Israelis when they saw that their that the IDF failed them, they picked up their gun and they went and they fought the terrorists. Including there's a fantastic story in Haaretz. Uh, sorry, Gadi. Sorry, that's a a a, 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 a paper that uh, should have a relationship with Gadi, but no longer does. Uh, but uh, uh, Amir Tibone's uh, father, Amir Tibone was locked with his kids uh, in the shelter with terrorists all around them. They had to tell the kids, shh, 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 be quiet for eight hours. And um, his father fought his way to save his grandkids. And that that spirit is alive in Israel. And, it, and it's going to be tapped into in the next uh, uh, in the next few months. Baruch Hashem. Uh, Tony Badran, top that. <laughs> uh, I mean, one of the interesting things also that we're saying, I, I hope, I don't know if I can say I, I have a glimmer uh, of, of optimism about it, but I do hope that there's a clear dividing line that's emerging from this, right? The policy that, as Lee was saying, you know, this is what it looks like. Barack Obama, over a decade and a half, took us in this direction, both abroad and at home. That's what that looks like. It looks like it's a clarifying line. That is what barbarism looks like. And that barbarism, we want to align ourselves with that. We want to become that. And we want to import that. Uh, I hope that clarity emerges from this tragedy. Fantastic. Lee Smith. I mean, I'll, ju I'll just second what Tony says. I think, you know, I've, I've been that surprised but i've been very happy just to see different social media stuff and americans stand with israel and the ones who don't you see what happened the different protests in new york throughout florida seattle washington washington dc i mean the people who are getting out there now and we're demonstrating on behalf of palestine are demonstrating on behalf of animals right i, I mean th i mean this is this is a day after what we saw on social media so the Americans see the Americans see what the Israelis are up against. The Americans see what civilization is up against. Um, so it, it 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 is very clarifying. Is that a glimmer of hope? Um, yeah, I think it's a glimmer of hope. And uh, uh, um, American <laughs> Americans stand with civilization, and they stand with our Israeli friends and brothers. Perfect, Jacob Siegel. Oh, you know the the history of uh, Jews dealing with internal strife uh, does not always have um, endings we might hope for, but the history of Jews in the modern state of Israel dealing with existential threats um, tends to produce uh, 
a unity of purpose and a vision. And, you know, I, I am in a very different situation uh, than Gadi is in because I'm not immersed. My Hebrew is not good enough for me to be immersed in the journalist scene here. So my neighbors are um, the farthest thing from journalists in Moreshev, where I live. And I, I have seen um, some real solidarity here. And I, I have seen a, a, a kind of uh, unity of, of purpose that um, seems to me fundamentally different from the kind of brittle divisiveness of the country that I had uh, been living in prior to that. And uh, so, uh, you know, it, it is more than just unfortunate. It's horrible that it takes this, but uh, it, it seems to me that um, we've been in these positions before and it has uh, brought out what was needed. Gadi Tao, last but not least. Yeah, what I'll say is not that different from the other panelists, only maybe in a more Israeli language. Uh, wokeism is a sort of moral rot that that spoils your immune system. And the advantage that Israel has is that reality check is very strong here. So we are getting a shock of reality check here. And, and hopefully the IDF will stop acting like a human right NGO because what happened with with the language of human rights is that it has turned into a weapon of anti-Semitism and we need to expose that. So if in earlier days, uh, blood libels talked of Jews killing Christian children to put them in their matzot, now international human rights organizations are spreading blood, li blood libels about, about Israel. And 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 this may this atrocity may also tip um, our moral scales back to where they ought to be. Thank you. Uh, I know a lot of the uh, thousand people or so who are tuning in right now are asking the same question uh, with an increasing degree of of urgency, which is what can we do now? We want to do something. Um, it is very frustrating to us as there is very little realistically that we can do at least in this stage. Uh, we can and must absolutely pray and be with other Jews and engage in doing anything and everything Jewish uh, to bring on more light and strengthens precisely the thing uh, that those terrorists tried to extinguish on Saturday morning. Uh, and if you're looking for more information, more analysis, and more brilliance from uh, all the spectacular panelists uh, who join us today and others, please, please, please uh, join us at tabletmag.com where we will be having uh, ongoing reporting uh, from the ground uh, analysis and, and, and other uh, breaking news as this war progresses. And now the only thing left to do is to thank Jacob Siegel, Lee Smith, Gary Taub, Tony Badran, and Michael Duran, and all of you for taking the time. Toda and Am Yisrael Chai. Thanks, Leo.